You're listening to The Mountain Gardener with local expert Ken Lane. Mountain gardening can be challenging, but with Ken's tips, tricks, and garden advice, you'll reap huge rewards. Now, welcome back to The Mountain Gardener. And welcome to this week's edition of The Mountain Gardener. This is your host, Ken Lane. And we've just been doing this for a lot of years, sharing how the, the sequence, the cycles of the mountains of Arizona. We are left out in the dark here in, in this central highlands area. I would say from Flagstaff, really even the Four Corners area, all the way down to whenever you get down to Phoenix. I would say 3,500 3, foot level and above, we're on our own. I mean, there's no garden advice out there for us. Everything is written on the TVs and magazines for the East Coast. I mean, that, that's where HGTV, that's where Fine Garden Magazines, uh, Home and Garden, uh, even even the Phoenix Home and Garden Magazine is made for deserts. So most of the content coming out of Arizona is for the Phoenix. That's where all the bodies are. That's where the people are. So they don't focus on us because there's just not enough bodies to market to. And so we're left. If you do get any info, it's from California, maybe, but that's more tropical. That doesn't pertain to us. The cycles are totally different. If you're coming here from Palm Springs, Southern California, Phoenix, Tucson, you almost, and you move to the high country of Arizona, you almost need to reboot and erase. I mean, just, you need to start over. Maybe 10% of the info that, that you have learned in those areas relates to here, but most of it, it's just different cycles. Roses, you, you prune them at a different cycle. You don't even grow the right, you don't even grow the same kind of fruit trees. You don't grow the same kind of, of flowers the same time. And so they're just totally different. Phoenix right now, completely shut down. The garden centers, they just kind of go off on vacation and there there's hardly any customers in there and they can't keep the greenhouses cool enough. It's like 140 in there. Who would go inside? And so they take a little sabbatical. Up here, it's beautiful. I mean, it's easy. We've got cooling systems in our in our greenhouses. Things are in color. They're in bloom. They're inspirational. It's all the summer things that can can be planted. And so you could walk through and go, oh, that's pretty. And you could take it home and plant it, and your success would be tremendous. Because we don't get hot. I mean, okay, 90 degrees. That's not hot to a plant. That's hot to you because you want it to be 88 or 85 or 70, 70 degrees. But to a plant, that's wonderful. But in the evening, it does cool off. Did you know that plants do most of their growing during the evening? That's because it's cool and crisp and it just they just go, ah, oh, I, just, I just love growing in the mountains. I think I'll set more flowers tomorrow morning. Uh, my my gardener is going to have more magnolia blossoms, going to have more hibiscus, more roses, more crepe myrtles, more zinnias, more. They're going to have more, more, more because they like the summer season. And so you plant them and they just root out and take going. The a little insider tip for, for the mountains of Arizona specifically, June. June is your hardest month to grow anything. June is the month you want to get plants just to survive and get through. June is when it goes from, for sometime in June, first part of June, it goes from 70s, just wonderful. We're all starting to get out and enjoy finally the weather. And it goes to 95, 100, just like that. And so then it's hot. That's not the problem. It's the prevailing southwest wind and no humidity. So you get 10% humidity. And a prevailing southwest wind that just is unrelenting on that brand new growth, that's why it's hard. Well, right now, all the growth is mature. It's hard, It's grown and it's kind of solidified. And it's thickened up and it's got some skin and it's going, I'm okay with this. Bring it on. And there is no prevailing southwest wind. Yes, it's windy in the mountains, but then that southwest just blowing day and night all the time, that does not happen. That's unique to the spring. And then it's humid. Okay, it's not humid compared to you know Georgia, the Carolinas, Missouri, but it's plenty humid for Arizona. So you went from five eight percent humidity in spring to thirty five, forty, fifty, sixty percent humidity. Oh my gosh, we feel like we're swimming through the air. That's that's a, that's plants love that. 
they're able to take that in. You might even get a little afternoon or, or evening dew. In fact, we were looking out over the Dells uh, so earlier this week, and there was fog kind of settled in a temperature inversion and brought in and just hanging in there. And then the Dells were right in front of that, almost accented and framed. Uh, it was beautiful. It was picturesque. Plants love that. It's unique to this monsoonal season. And so you'll find your success goes up. So just kind of things to kind of watch for, but mainly don't get lulled into thinking you can do things the same way here as you did in other parts of the country. We're different. It's unique. The cycles are different. The altitude alone, the brightness of the sun, this, this swing of humidity from dry to, to moist, that's different. So you want to learn how to, how to prep for that, how to make a difference. So one thing to watch right now, the fruit harvest. It's a good time to plant a fruit tree. It's a, I'll put that out there. But the fruit harvest has been tremendous. It's unbelievable. And so it seems like in the mountains, fruits are feast or famine. You either have more fruit you know what to do with, or you just have very, very few. And you're competing for the birds to get the few that are left. This year, cherries were unbelievable. A month ago, we started picking cherries. It was a blockbuster a harvest. Apricots right now are coming off. It is a blockbuster type of harvest. I mean, I'm seeing signs, free apricots. Please just take some. There's too much. Peaches will come off next week. So they're starting to, starting to come off, depending on your elevation. So it's been a really good. Your pears and apples, they're forming. They're, you, we typically harvest those late, late summer, early fall. So they have another few weeks to go. But it's time to... To, to harvest. The harvest is on. Get that canning supply, get that dryer, you know, drying leathers out and get, get it going. Uh, one thing to watch, this is also when the rats come. So we have a pack rat, this very large wood rat that loves going around and they're attracted to all that fruit. And so watch them at night. They'll crawl up the, this tree and actually pick off fruit. And so they're crawling all over your fruit. You got rats on your fruit. Picking them, they'll, you'll, they'll take them back, and you'll see them squirreled around in the built-in grill. You'll see them squirreled in that cabinet that holds all the furniture pads. You'll see them in the scrub oak uh, just piling up. There's a pile of peaches or a pile of, of apricots. Keep the fruit cleaned up. Don't let, I, I don't mind them climbing the tree and sharing a little bit. But rats, I'm a southern boy. All rats should die. I mean, that's just that's you should not have rats in your yard. And so I've got a, a, a trap line basically in my backyard where the fruit trees are and the vegetables. I've got three traps in a row. Uh, rat traps, big rat traps. I've got the type. I sell them here at the garden center. They're they're very easy to set. I put peanut butter and I'll shove a little some sort of nut into the peanut butter, and it's irresistible two rats. So the, I'll catch about one a week, especially while the fruit is forming. So I would encourage you to, to make sure you keep that fruit cleaned up or you'll attract every rat in the neighborhood. They'll be at your house. They'll have a party at night. You'll never even know it. They're coming over and they're, come, they're night creatures, nocturnal, and you never even know they were there until they start stripping the wire, the insulation off your wire in the attic. They start destroying the motor in that RV. They start packing your built-in grill with all this wood and debris and apricots or peaches. So be careful. Be, be attuned to that. It's something that's unique to the mountains of Arizona. They seem to be at all elevations everywhere, but they especially like the chaparral scrubby area, the oaks, and manzanitas, Pinion pines, that's where the, the, the pack rats are, are worse. And so the, the voles, little mice, not as bad. Yes, they can get in there, but they're not climbing and causing mischief. They get in the mulch pile, the compost. They'll, get in, they'll eat the bottom out of your pumpkin or, or your, your cucumbers, but they're not as mischievous. Pack rats are huge rats on steroids that you got to be diligent to keep them thinned. Literally, I was catching one or two rats a week last year. Now, luckily, it's less because I've, I've thinned them down and created a halo effect. So there's not as not as thick, and you can do the same. But if you're new to the area, and say you come from possum country, we don't have those. We have pack rats. That's our possum. That's our thing that we we struggle with here. Yeah, some javelina. Yeah, some deer. But pack rats during the fruit. 
put up some traps or baits or something and protect your RV, your grills, your hot tubs, and protect that the padding. That's where they're really drawn to it. So really be, be keen on that. Be right back. You're listening to local garden expert Ken Lane, also known as the Mountain Gardener. Ken can be found throughout the week at Waters Garden Center in Prescott. Listen each week as he answers timely garden questions unique to mountain landscapes. Wondering why the grass is always greener on the other side? Well, it's probably because your neighbor used the all-purpose fertilizer from Waters Garden Center. Monsoon is right around the corner, and it's the perfect time to feed your plants. Waters All-Purpose Fertilizer is the only organic made especially for Arizona mountain soils. Don't buy a bunch of different fertilizer for your flowers, veggies, trees, or grass. This one does it all. The plants on your side will be happier, healthier, well, greener. Safe, natural, organic. Waters Garden Center in Prescott. We believe retirement means more time to garden and plants make you happier. At Waters Garden Center. You're listening to The Mountain Gardener with local expert Ken Lane. Mountain gardening can be challenging, but with Ken's tips, tricks, and garden advice, you'll reap huge rewards. Now, welcome back to The Mountain Gardener. And we are back with Lisa Waters Lane, my favorite gal, my travel buddy. You're my travel buddy. What are we doing after the kids have left? Now, what do, what do uh, empty nesters do? Travel. I guess. We haven't figured it out yet. Yeah, we're still in that We're working mode. on it. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think we're doing a pretty good job. Bought a, uh, a new side-by-side. We go out. It's not so new anymore. No, it's a year old. Taking it out. We need to take it out more. We do. But it's been, it's been spring, and then we, we booked a trip to Ireland. Yeah. As our 30th anniversary. Mm-hmm. Uh, kind of gift to us. Mm-hmm. And, uh, well, spring, and now we're off to Ireland. It's just like, well, we'll, we'll get at this when we get back. <laughs> we'll write it more. I want to go up to see where the Goodwin Fire was, how bad it was. That's one of my favorite places, Palace uh-huh. Station, uh, th- those areas, Mount Union. Just see mm-hmm. what happened yeah. if they'll let us through. I don't know. I don't know. We'll find well, out. It doesn't matter. We have a side-by-side. It'll go any it <laughs> climb a tree. It's amazing. True. So, yeah. Anyway, so Yeah, back. we're working on trying to figure out life after children. What yeah. do you do when you don't have children demanding all your time every weekend, every... We'll figure does, that they out. do tend to absorb a lot of... We have the grandkids over. They were over last week, and uh, the, it it was like a relief when they left. It was nice to have them, <laughs> but then they, they like, you're like spent at the end of the day going... Yeah. It's like a battery going, whoa. Yeah. <laughs> it's fun to have them, but it's also nice to wave goodbye and... And, and millennials just don't plan anything. They kind of live <laughs> by the seat of their pants. There's they no do. plan. You kind of go, we're, we, we live a very rigid, we have to meet deadlines. I mean, trucks show up at a certain time. You better have crews to unload them. It was just deadlines for shows, deadlines for columns, dead, add, add deadli- deadlines. We live and die by deadlines. They wouldn't know what a deadline if it hit them in the face. <laughs> they wouldn't know. It's amazing. I don't, were we like that when we were 20s? I'm sure we were somewhat more I, carefree. I, I, I don't remember. It's I'm, best just to judge the previous generation, <laughs> not to actually remember how you were. <laughs> if you're a millennial, I'm sorry. We love you. Don't you. tune out. We still, yeah. <laughs> we love our first time home buyers. We help them yes. out too. Yeah. Uh, we help our. This is our mansion that we just built. So I finally got it because I moved to Prescott and sold my house in expensive market and came mm-hmm. here and paid cash we, and everything in between. Right. So we see all of that here. Yeah. Prescott's an interesting mix of, of different types of, of, of homeowners. We even see Prescott College. We love the earthy, you know, down to earth trying to make, I want to get back to the earth. We, we like that. That's mm-hmm. us. If I had to go to college again. That would be on my radar. Think so? They're top notch for what they They're do. Nice. They're one of the best in the country. Mm-hmm. And I'm just not Emory Riddle material. I mean, not I, smart enough. I'm not that <laughs> mathematic stuff. I'm, I'm too free thinking. I'm too uh, creative sometimes to be so rigid that 
for sure, if I'm doing security, they're going to break in the back door. If I'm, yeah. if I'm going to engineer a plane to stay up in the air, it's going to fall. Oh, yeah. If a bridge is going to, you you're can, not an engineer. No, you don't no. want to. You don't want me doing that. Your world is not black and white. You want me to market it for you when it's finally. <laughs> you want me to sell it all over the globe when you get done, and uh, yeah. everyone will buy into it. Mm-hmm. So that's that my forte. True. This is a garden question thing, though, right? Yes. So, do we got any? Oh, of course we do. Questions. So, uh, Jan wants to know. She has in her garden. She has those little tiny black ants. Oh yeah, sure. Can't get rid of them. Now yeah. they're moving into her yeah. house, uh, and we've battled those in the past. She wants to know how do you safely get rid of those little buggers? You should kill them because you got to get rid of the queen. They're just like any ant or or any kind of a bee nest. Once the queen is gone, the whole nest just basically through attrition dies off. You have to get the queen. And so where they're at, those little piss ants are tiny, tiny black ants. You can hardly mm-hmm. see them until they're in your food pantry. <laughs> then you see them. They're underneath the rocks. They're yeah. underneath the bushes. They're underneath things. They're protected. And the rain has caused them to start dividing. They, they like get too big for this nest and start forming another nest. And they want to build a nest in your loaf of bread. <laughs> That's where they want to be. Yeah. And so you got to find that. So probably walk around like they were in our dry wash, heavy. Mm-hmm. And so I would go through and just kind of knock all the dry, all the boulders, the ankle busters, or the, the little boulders that they build a dry wash with. And when I saw the ants swarm, I'd go, there they are. And then I'd lift that rock out and I would spray them with a bug killer. So I'd get the nest and then I would bait them with an ant bait. There's a liquid bait that we have here. There's a granular and a liquid. It's organic, so mm-hmm. if the birds get into it, your pets, your kids, it's all safe. And you just sprinkle a little bit out on that so any of them that I missed, they would pick it up and take it and feed it directly to the queen. And that's sort of how we got it, got ahead of it. And now, as I'm gardening, I'm out. If I run into a nest, I make sure I go out of my way to go spray, give them some food that's laced with some either acids or something that keeps them in check. And so if you just keep up on if you can get ahead of them, now, you, now you're in a maintenance mode, you can keep up with them. That's the thing. Rain is when they really get bad. Yeah. The red ants, while we're covering ants, are even easier because they're so obvious to, to spot. The fire ants, the big mounding ants. That's one where you see a hill. Uh, they make a, an organic uh, bug, um, ant killer. So it's a bait. They pick it up a little bit larger pellet, and they take it down the nest and they actually feed it to the queen. Again, those nests can be two, three, four feet deep. So it's hard to get a a liquid or or gas or anything down deep enough to kill off the hill. You need the ants to pick it up and feed it to her, and -hmm. then they'll die off. There's one called Come and Get (laughs) It. It's an organic bug killer. Great name, Come and Get It. And the ants do come and get it. You just Mm -hmm. sprinkle some on top of the hill. And they'll be gone. I, I have noticed if it's a really big established hill, I need to come back and rebate it. Maybe two weeks later, for some reason, some other ants hatched. Something happened. If hmm. I bait it twice, for sure obliterated. Once, usually obliter- obliterated. Just keep an eye on it. Okay. Come and get it for big ants. And I forget the other one. It says ant and roach killer or something, the other one. So, that's organic. That's organic, yeah. Okay. So all we have is organic. Be careful of your pesticide stuff because they're deadly. If you have dogs and they get on their paws and they lick their paws, mm-hmm. birds get in, quail, that's not good. So yeah, okay. I think you some of these things, we can go organic. You just need, need to know what you're doing, mm-hmm. and we can help you here at Waters. Okay. Next question is from Angie. She has a rental house, so she's looking for an easy care shade tree, oh, kind super. of bulletproof, yeah. uh, to put into this rental house. So she wants some suggestions. Such a, a great question and easy to deal with. That's one you probably want to come in to the gardens and we can walk you through and show you. But some of the most bulletproof, some of the things we've used in our own, own rental properties, uh, any of your locust family, if it says locust, it's going to be good. So there's purple robe locust, there's golden locust, shade master locust, honey locust. All of those are very strong, very easy, low care. The tenant can, you can be vacant for two months, the tree will live. Also, ash. Anything that's an ash, the ash family. So Patmores, Raywoods, of course, the Arizona ash. There's a native one that grows here. Good, good choices for large trees. 
Uh, I would think, think some shorter trees that aren't truly defined as shade trees, but very tough. Uh, the desert willows. It gets up 12, 15 feet tall. I would say uh, red buds. There's a native uh, western red bud that's, that grows very naturally here. Those are two very good, strong in the mid to about 20 foot level. Not truly defined as a, as a shade tree. Really, it's 30 foot plus because now you can park a car underneath it or <laughs> RB and still it's big enough to shade. Those are more ornamental, but still big enough to provide shade on a patio, mm-hmm. front, front entrance. See, those are three, four, five really good choices for those that just want to travel and not to be a slave to the yard or for investment properties. That's unique. That's different. The tenants don't always, sometimes they got green thumbs. They really do care. Other times, they're almost abusive to your butt. I mean, they should be shot. There's actually some that are professional tenants, and they just do nothing but destroy your place on purpose. And then they have you come pay for them. It's ridiculous. If you've had, if you've been a landlord for any length of time, you run into these. And so these are some that will fit any model, no matter who who's there. Hopefully, you get a tenant that stays for years to come, and you just love them and they're friends. You invite them over to barbecues, <laughs> but these will live there or anywhere so good questions this week okay ken elisa lane and the mountain gardeners be right back the mountain gardener your source for garden advice right for the higher elevation of arizona with local garden expert and the mountain gardener himself ken lane listen in every week for ken's tips tricks and techniques that are guaranteed to make a difference in your yard this season the get real men's expo is dedicated to spiritual guys of all faiths This year is full of exotic cars, motorcycles, and competitions filled with guys young and old in archery, baseball, and axe throwing. Ladies, yeah, you heard me right. This is a great father-son event that creates memories and motivates men to reconnect with their community, family, and a God that uniquely loves each one of us. Award-winning coach Tommy Bowden is flying in as our motivational speaker. Coach Bowden is not only famous for his wins at Clemson University and acclaimed author, but super motivational when it comes to living your faith as a man. His testimony is riveting. You have to hear it. I mean, wow. This year's expo is the morning of August 19th from 830 to 1. Coach Bowden shares his fearless leadership as a football coach, husband, and father at 11. Remember, August 19th, Yavapai College in Prescott and the Get Real Men's Expo. If you're a man, it's free. We believe strawberries taste better picked fresh from the garden at Waters Garden Center. You're listening to The Mountain Gardener with local expert Ken Lane. Mountain gardening can be challenging, but with Ken's tips, tricks, and garden advice, you'll reap huge rewards. Now welcome back to The Mountain Gardener. I am, I'm starting to struggle a bit with some mildew. I'm seeing a little bit, some of the leaves of my Swiss chard, roses, squash. I'm seeing this white, almost like a powder. It comes off, but the leaves get coated in white, and then it, that leaf will die. It's unique to the to monsoon season. It gets pronounced. Some things that cause that, of course, birds spread it so easily. It's like... It's sort of like athlete's foot of the foliage. It just it just gets on the on the skin. It starts eating the skin part of the the leaves on that plant. The plant will become stressed, stop fruiting. So my squash, they just won't set fruit if they're covered in, in mildew. They just they just go in this hi- hibernation mode or or stressed mode. The roses stop blooming, and so you really want to get on this. I've seen it on euonymus. I've seen it on red tip photinia. Just several different things uh, throughout the neighborhoods. And so I'd say it's time to walk the yard. We've been into the monsoon season long enough where it's been a month or so. And we've had a lot of moisture, a lot of rain. And some things cause this. The humidity is what what makes it go. And so if you've had, uh, let's say, privet, a wax leaf privet, right next to your front door, and it's where the air doesn't quite move uh, as it normally does, or or if it's gotten a little overgrown and it causes this overgrown or, or crowding effect, all of a sudden the rains will come and you'll see some white leaves start showing up on this privet. It's because it's, it's stale. It's just it's waiting for that warm, dry air to just uh, for the bacteria to start forming. A bird or bug will come in and land on it. It's on their feet. All of a sudden the spore is there, and then 
It starts growing like crazy. comes out of nowhere. But it comes when the monsoon season, just a few weeks into the monsoon season. What to do? If it's an edible, so for my pumpkins, my squash, things that I'm eating, Swiss chard, I spray copper fungicide because it's all natural. It's organic. A little bit of copper is good for you. And so this will knock back that spore and keep it from spreading. So especially if it's a little bit heavier uh, use, you're seeing a lot of it. I would say copper fungicide. Keep it on there. I'd spray it every 10 to 14 days until I see the new growth coming out clean. Now, copper fungicide is good. It's all natural. So it's safer for things that you eat, but it's not the strongest thing you can have. If I've got a 12-foot tall red tip photinia or a big euonymus or a big, a big plant, roses, a whole bed, and I'm starting to see it spread through the bed, then I break out the big guns, the non-organic. So this, there's a place for non-organic, and I'm kind of, I'd hate to go there, but sometimes you just got to break out the big guns. So there I use Bonide's Infuse, I-N-F-U-S-E. It's a concentrate. You put it in a hose-end sprayer, and you coat the plant until it is absolutely dripping wet. Every portion, especially underneath the leaves, this is where a good good quality hose-end sprayer makes a big difference, makes this job super easy. And so I'll spray Infuse, and the reason I do this is it's systemic the plant will actually absorb some of this fungus killer. And so you don't want to use systemics on things you're going to eat because the plant will absorb a piece of this. Now you're eating it later. That's not good. It's not rated for edibles. It's not labeled for that. That's That's why for those you use copper fungicide, all natural. It is labeled for that. You can spray up to the day of harvest. You can wash things off and it's just fine. But infuse is better lasts longer, uh, has more, is more aggressive because the plant actually receives it better. So infuse is what I used for my bigger things out in the yard, my roses mainly, and then copper fungicides, what I use for my edible things. This is confusing. Both products are here at Waters Garden Center. Come in, bring a sample. We'll ID it for you if you're not sure. Uh, if you could, some of these diseases, and especially disease, Put it in a Ziploc baggie. That way we're not spreading it throughout the neighborhood. We're not spreading it throughout my inventory at least. I got, I got families to feed here. I don't, want them, I don't want my plants. I don't have to treat my plants for mildew that was brought in from a customer. Spread so easy. A Ziploc baggie. We can ID it in a flash then show you how to treat it. Those are some tricks, some things to watch, something to put on your radar that's pronounced right now. It's pretty active. Not really on your evergreens, like pine, spruce, fir, cypress, cedars. It's not on that. In fact, you don't see powdery mildew on those. More leafy things you'll see powdery mildew on. Roses are famous, but I get it every year on my pumpkin-y kind of, my, my squash family of plants. In fact, I just spray copper fungicide as a preventative. I just know I'm going to get it. It's a matter of time. So I'll spritz the foliage every, I don't know, two, three weeks. Just go, ah, be happy, boys. Grow and be just fruit for me. I'm, I'm growing a giant pumpkin right now. It's the size of a, right now as we speak, it's the size of a basketball. So it's going to be the size of a, a shopping cart. By the time I'm done, I'll roll it up to the front of the house and carve a face into it. I, I want it to grow. And the plant can't grow if it's covered in mildew. So and you should watch that in your yard as well. So powdery mildew, Google it, it'll come right up. But that's how you solve it. Be right back. The Mountain Gardener, your source for garden advice right for the higher elevation of Arizona with local garden expert and the Mountain Gardener himself, Ken Lane. Listen in every week for Ken's tips, tricks, and techniques that are guaranteed to make a difference in your yard this season. Wondering why my garden looks amazing? Well, that's personal. The personal garden shopper service at Waters Garden Center, that is. Before talking with my personal shopper, I had no idea which plants would be best for me. But now my garden is bursting with flowers and buzzing with hummingbirds. Just go to watersgardencenter.com, click on Shop, and choose Personal Garden Shopper. A Waters Garden expert will pick the perfect plants for you, personally. The Personal Garden Shopper, only at Waters Garden Center in Prescott. 
We believe searching Waters plants are better than a Google search at Waters Garden Center. And we are back in the studio with the segment that gets all the rave reviews. So people, we see them in the community and, and they go, oh, Ken, good show. We really like your wife. She's on the show. It's great. The way you guys are, that she's, she's brilliant. I'm going, this is Lisa Waters Lane. She's in the studio and she does our inspiration piece, our, our woman's touch, how to make it feel less lunar and more <laughs> nested, glorious garden. I want to have friends over and show them my garden kind of feel. And you've got that uh, to, to the point where our house is beautiful, my dear, just stunning with all the color. Well done. Thank you. It's kind of a, we work together to make it happen. Well, that's true. I'm the hired muscle. You're the well, color, color, bring, bring flower, bring flower, bring flowers, bring flowers, <laughs> bring more containers, more containers, more containers. <laughs> Don't you think that's enough, Lisa? <laughs> Never enough. <laughs> anyway, Never so what do you got for us this week? What, what's going on? So <laughs> this week I thought we'd talk about um, sometimes you just need to create almost like a little secret garden or a little privacy uh, whether that's lining your fence, uh, like a, a property line, or whether that's uh, creating a little small space in your yard. Uh, maybe good. you need to, maybe you got a neighbor moving in, somebody building a house that wasn't there before, or uh, somebody just moved in and, you know, they brought their motorhome with yeah. them, or uh, Mrs. Kravitz moved in next door, you know, and she's crying in your kitchen window so you just need to create a little privacy or maybe you just want a little secret garden effect yeah. um, so you can you can put things in that create screens um, give you a little privacy i love our hot tub area mm -hmm. it was all open it had a beautiful hot tub five person hot tub you sit there and soak and the neighbors they're like it seems like they always show up right when you jump <laughs> in the hot tub what is that it's i'm sure it's not on purpose oh, not no. mrs kravitz or any of that you know spine and neighbor but but it's just it happens more often than not. Mm -hmm. uh, so we put containers around it, and now we've grown up. In fact, I just had to cut back the horsetail. We've got my grandmother's old wash tub. This mm -hmm. is an iron kettle that you'd do. I mean, back before washing machines, I had my grandmother's iron wash tub. And so we put, no one wants a big iron tub sitting there, so I planted uh, a horsetail. Mm -hmm. It was up head high. This thing was monstrous. The Pretty last big. windstorm, it blew over. Yeah. It was getting too much leverage. So I just cut it off to right where you're, you're sitting in the hot tub. The, the, the fronds or this mm -hmm. evergreen, spiky, grassy thing will be just above head high. Mm -hmm. I went, oh, that's perfect. Then it's got some trees behind that. And so it just it feels, I mean, the neighbor's 15 feet away, 20 feet. Yeah. And it feels like you're the only one on the planet when you're sitting in the hot tub. Mm -hmm. And you can create that, a back patios oh, entrance. You can have that. Mm -hmm. So how do we do that? Well, planting trees and shrubs around in there. So you do kind of have to decide what's the height that I need. So that's your, your first question. You have to ask yourself, what height do I need to create that privacy? And once you know the height, then you go hunting for those things that are going to give you the height. Because you can go anywhere from 30 feet, you know, Arizona cypress, uh, blue spruce, Austrian pines. Those are all big trees that are going to give you some height. You know, so with height usually comes your width. If your uh, blue spruce is going to get, what, 30, 35 yeah, feet easily. tall, easily a 20-foot spread. Yeah. Uh, Austrian pine, 30, 40 foot tall. There again, 20 15, foot spread. 20, yeah. You know, so think about the height and width. What do you, what's the height that you need? What's the width that you need? Um, and then you can start shopping for those trees to give you that depth and the and height and width that you need. A little trick that we've done in the past is some of the smaller things. If you don't want it to get too big, they, they stay smaller because they grow slower. Mm-hmm. And so you want the instant growth with the uh, privacy now. Mm -hmm. So sometimes we've, we, in the past, a couple of projects, you and I have blended the two together. Mm -hmm. we, we've put what we tr typically want. We want a small, you know, privet or silverberry, mm -hmm. something more elegant, smaller, quaint, that's less maintenance. But we need it. They, they, they're small. They don't, they're going to be three years where they fill in four or five maybe. 
So then we put fast growing like butterfly bush, Mm -hmm. fast growing cottonwoods, Lombardi poplars, things that grow like tremendous growth. This year they're providing growth now, but they're going to overgrow their space. They're going to lift pavers. They're going to cause grief Mm -hmm. and mayhem. But we look at them as temporary. Right. We're, they're only going to be here for three years most. Then we're going to cut them down. We we know we're going to cut them down once the other more foundational things, mm-hmm. the, the long-lived things, are finally up to size. So we blend the two things together. Mm-hmm. I think more folks need to do that. Plants right. are not forever. They're right. for whenever you want them to be. And then there's a time when they go. You just have you to be willing out. to yeah. do that. Yeah. Some people are like, I could never cut down a tree. These are not puppy dogs, people. <laughs> These are just plants. Come on. <laughs> but you're right. Yes, you can easily put a cottonwood in, a willow in, because they grow so fast. But yes, you've got to be willing to put them out of there when they've done what you want them to do, which is give you fast-growing privacy. But when those other trees get big enough, you got to, otherwise you're going to have, they're going to grow into each other and you're going to have unhealthy trees. So are you thinking solid wall of, of red tip or are you thinking a mixture more garden-esque? I think it's always better to grow a, a mixture of things. It's healthier for them. It gives you variety that way. Say you have a, a, a bacterial disease or something that comes through and wipes out a certain variety of something, a tree or a shrub then at least you still got something else yeah, in advice. there. Uh, plus, it's just more pleasing. Yeah. It's kind of boring Mo- to have a wall of... Yeah, monocultures are more East Coast kind of thing. It's mm-hmm. same thing in a perfect row space. It's a formal garden is what mm-hmm. that's called. We have more informal gardens, especially up in the mountains where you get trees and pine trees and junipers and oaks. and man, These are informal landscapes, and it looks more natural right. when you blend some of these things with within the nature that's already there and it feels more more like a garden oh, yeah. less like a formal like hedgerow yeah you're right definitely more east coast grow the hedges but i've i guess it depends there again on what you want what are you looking for uh, but some other uh shrub or trees that don't get horrifically tall and overgrown but a lot of your junipers there's some really nice uh spartan juniper moon glow uh, Blue Point, Wichita Blue, um, all of those get in that 12 to 15 foot height, uh, 5 to 8 foot width that you can use in a, in a normal size yard, yeah. city lot yard. Um, they can give you a really nice privacy um, screen. You can mix those easily in with some flowering shrubs that can give you an, a nice look. So you get color in your flowering shrubs in the summertime, uh, in the green or the the green or blue green as your backdrop. Yeah, I think we need to use junipers more in the mountains. Everyone's afraid of of allergies. Yeah, but we're surrounded by juniper forest, folks. It's <laughs> not the little tiny cute things. They've bred the pollen out of the the ornamental ones. Mm-hmm. It's the natives, that big old male that turns yellow and explodes with pollen right. and covers your car. <laughs> you don't stand a chance if you live in the mountains. You got juniper allergies. It's not a couple of junipers, but they naturalize. Mm-hmm. So easily, especially the ornamental ones, because they're related right. to the cousins, the native cousins. Mm-hmm. They naturalize equally as well. They're equally as robust. Low maintenance, low care. Mm-hmm. You know, trim them, give them a haircut, if that, once a year, and you're done. That's right. it. Mm-hmm. Low water, just that they're good choices. Mm-hmm. Emerald arborvitae is another one that's, that's used frequently. Um, probably not my favorite. I don't know why, but it's used. You're not from the Midwest. <laughs> Midwesterners <laughs> love that. You know, one I liked was uh, that we screened that huge propane tank with down in Skull Valley. Oh, yeah. Was uh, um, Cotone uh, Cotone Aster. Aster. Cor- uh, mm-hmm. Coral Beauty Cotoneaster. Coral Berry. Uh, Did I get that right? Clusterberry. Clusterberry Cotoneaster. Fa- mm-hmm. Fast growing. That's a nice one. Thick, green. Mm-hmm. We hedged it. That one we actually did hedge and mm-hmm. keep it uh, up to just, just above tank level, which was well above head high. There's a huge propane yeah. tank, like a submarine going through the yard. Yeah. And this softened it and it just made it feel relaxing in the back, uh, out oh, the you're back. Right. That's a terrific one. Well, some good good choices, Lisa. Thank you very much. Uh, privacy screens. Come and talk to Lisa and the crew, and we can give you the grand tour of privacy screens for your yard. Bring, take a picture, iPad. Mm-hmm. Bring it in. We we'll go, oh, we got this. Well, here's what you do. Uh, right back with Ken and Lisa Lane and the Mountain Gardeners. 
the Mountain Gardener, your source for garden advice right for the higher elevation of Arizona with local garden expert and the Mountain Gardener himself, Ken Lane. Listen in every week for Ken's tips, tricks, and techniques that are guaranteed to make a difference in your yard this season. Wondering why the grass is always greener on the other side? Well, it's probably because your neighbor used the all-purpose fertilizer from Waters Garden Center. Monsoon is right around the corner, and it's the perfect time to feed your plants. Waters All-Purpose Fertilizer is the only organic made especially for Arizona mountain soils. Don't buy a bunch of different fertilizer for your flowers, veggies, trees, or grass. This one does it all. The plants on your side will be happier, healthier, well, greener. Safe, natural, organic. Waters Garden Center in Prescott. We believe in roses that smell like a rose at Waters Garden Center. May I just give a huge shout out to some of the unsung heroes of the city. Uh, if, if you're a mountain biker, road biker, any kind of, you spend any time on the roads where you're exposed to traffic, uh, you know how dirty and gritty and dangerous the bike lane is. I mean, it gets more dangerous to drive in the bike lane than be in the middle of traffic because there's so much debris and stuff showing up there. Street sweepers. I just saw one of them going by uh, going up and down the street. I know they aren't there to, to, for the bikers. They should be. They're there because rain has sloshed so much dirt and muck into the road. But really, they are such, they increase the quality of life that we don't give them proper credit for. And, and I, I think it's worth paying them to go up and down the street if, because we're an outdoor community. The, the mountains of Arizona, we're famous for being outdoors most of the year. If you're walking, hiking, biking, tricked, whatever, the street sweepers make a difference. And so our city councils, our city managers, I think we need to give them more credit than they're due. I know that the low man on the totem pole and you stick the rookie behind there and they go, go you know, 10 miles an hour all day long, but they make a difference in our safety, uh, at least from, from a road biker and a mountain biker, I, I, I ride my bike to the trail or I'm riding to work. Frequently, if you see a guy that maybe shouldn't be mountain biking uh, on the roads, looks like he might own a garden center, it's probably me. And so it, it's, it, it's, it's, it can be dangerous sometimes. Thank you for sweeping the streets. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I think you're the unsung heroes at the city depart, road works department. So anyway... Well, I don't know how I got off on that, but I just saw him today coming into work, and I went, gosh, I can't wait to ride my bike coming to work. Some things, you know, we worry about our retirement plans and tourism, and sometimes we just need to worry about us uh, here, quality of life, our parks, our, our, our swimming pools, our, our trailheads, our, our, our roads make a difference, and I think we need to spend more of our tax dollars and mental energy to make it better just for us to live here. And if we do that, they'll come anyway. So we'll get more people in. So I just, uh, anyway, I think some of the water should be used for us, not just save, 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 so we can give it to the developers and then build more houses so we can be surrounded by more people so they can use more resources. Don't get me going. So it just kind of, sometimes you need it for us. Just we've been here all of our lives and now we're giving it away anyway. Sometimes I feel like we're giving away the king, keys of the kingdom, uh, all in, yeah, won't, won't get going. Ah, relax, Ken. You need a bike ride. <laughs> if this is a garden show. Okay, back to garden advice. <laughs> Some things to watch uh, out in the yard. I, I am noticing that I'm still, I've sprayed once already. For spider mites, and I'm seeing some dead limbs coming up. There's dead limbs showing up on two things, and they're mainly evergreens. One, my junipers, and I've got a weeping redwood or sequoia. Very unusual, very ornamental thing. It's behind the pond, and it's got some dead branches on it. I took a closer look, and I went, whoa, wait a minute. I already sprayed for you guys. Spider mites were still on my evergreens. So if you see some dead limbs on your evergreens, you more than likely, it's an insect called spider mites. And they're on the inside. They kind of start from the bottom and work their way up. So that's, that's one thing to watch that I've noticed specifically in my yard and other yards, some samples from customers coming in, spider mites. You never see the actual insect. You only see the webbing or the damage 
to them, to, to that uh, evergreen. They seem to really have a flavor for evergreens. I have spotted them on my tomatoes, very rare, and I've spotted them on my rose. I have seen them on my rose, and I think they, they went from the rose to the tomato plant. They were side by side, but in, uh, an aside. I, I think that you need to watch that. Easy to spray. Spray, it's a multi-purpose insect spray. It's a spray I put together for the mountains of Arizona. Here, It's here at Waters Garden Center. I put it in a hose-in sprayer, and I just hose down that, that tree till it's dripping wet. Problem solved. While I'm doing it, and I've got the, the sprayer already rigged up, I spray all the evergreens at the same time. I just do them all. And I'm, I'm, I'm out here. Why not? With When you're spraying in summer, no matter what you're springing with, remember the days are warm. And so when you put uh, any kind of bug spray or, or oils, whatever, onto a warm plant, this product, these products are warmer too. They, they make the plant even warmer. So you want to spray when it's cool. Late, late, late in the day or very early morning is ideal. And so preferably earlier in the morning because it's less windy usually. The wind tends to pick up in the afternoon as these monsoon rains kind of power around and swirl around. It's less predictable. In the morning, you know, it's pretty calm. So I generally go out first thing before I come to work, before I even get going, get ready for the day, I'll go out and just spray my stuff. Uh, that's one. Second, I am noticing an awful lot of Leland cypress canker. Leland cypress is this beautiful 20 foot by 12 foot spread evergreen super bright green. It's related to our Arizona cypress, which is more blue. Arizona cypress is uh, more of a juniper looking kind of plant, blue plant. Uh, Leland cypress is related to it, but bright green. That's why people plant those. They're used as privacy screens, hedgerows, uh, wind breaks, uh, keeping the, the headlights of cars from coming in. It's a tremendously fast grower, big grower. And hardy as can be until this year. This year we're noticing there's a canker. There's a disease going through large swaths of, of the county, of the state. And it's, it's, it's actually wiping out all of the Leland Cypress in that area. It will go down a, a row, let's say down a driveway. It'll go through and kill every single one. Canker is a disease. It's a bacteria that gets underneath the bark. And it starts eating the eating the sugar, sugary bark tissue underneath the bark, and so it, it finally will girdle the tree, and the whole thing dies. But you're seeing big branches die out within that 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 tree, that shrub. There is no cure for it at the moment. We're researching this, trying to figure it out at the university level. We're trying to figure this out, but I have not found, I haven't seen any studies coming out going. This is effective. Kind of watch that one. What I'm telling my customers is if you have Leland Cypress, keep whether they have disease yet or not, whether they're losing branches yet or not, I predict they will eventually. But the best way you can do that is keep them healthy. Just keep them as strong as they can so they can fight off this canker by themselves. You can, you can look this up, Leland Cypress canker. It starts with a C. And uh, you'll just see some symptoms. The bark will start to ooze sap as the plant tries to flush out this bacteria. Uh, the, the plant can actually have little bubbles on it as the canker kind of kind of fruits and, and, and flowers and then spreads up and down the line. So those are some symptoms. And then finally, the tree goes from the bark, kills off some key branches, and eventually it'll just kill off branch after branch after branch, and the whole plant collapses till it's nothing but chainsaw bait. You're going to have to remove it. You might be thinking through, if you have Leland Cypress, and I hate to tell you this, I hate to tell you you're going to lose them, uh, but you might be thinking through, what could I be planting? I might even plant a few things so that it has time to grow up and fill in so when that Leland does finally collapse, you've got something that you don't start all over from, from the beginning again. Uh, but, but thinking that through, keep them healthy, keep them fertilized, use the all-purpose plant food. So we, we make it here at Waters Garden Center. It's a 744 mix with the cottonseed meal and the sulfur in that particular mix really makes evergreens really happy. 
So that that's one thing to watch. I would say while you're fertilizing, go ahead and feed your other native evergreens. Not, not so much junipers, although it works on junipers really well. It brings that blue out like like really nice. But really ponderosas and your pinion pines really benefit from a once a year feeding with this all-purpose plant food. It keeps the bark beetles out, the tip bore out. It helps them fight against scale. There's some things, our, our natural predators, the insects that are out there naturally like evergreens because this is where natural evergreen forests grow and they've learned to go after and anything that's stressed or weak, they just focus on it and take it out, including your Leland Cypress. Back with more after this Mountain Gardener. The Mountain Gardener, your source for garden advice right for the higher elevation of Arizona with local garden expert and the Mountain Gardener himself, Ken Lane. Listen in every week for Ken's tips, tricks, and techniques that are guaranteed to make a difference in your yard this season. Hi, Ken here with the Plants of the Week and our Lavender Shades Blooming Penta. One of the best butterfly-attracting plants. It's right up there with milkweed, only prettier. Hummingbirds have to dance around all the butterflies of this deeply colored summer bloomer. Plant a few in the vegetable garden to attract pollinators that help tomatoes and squash set more fruit, all for under $10. Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott, where people who love to garden, they love to shop. Wondering why my garden looks amazing? Well, that's personal. The personal garden shopper service at Waters Garden Center, that is. Before talking with my personal shopper, I had no idea which plants would be best for me. But now my garden is bursting with flowers and buzzing with hummingbirds. Just go to watersgardencenter.com, click on Shop, and choose Personal Garden Shopper. A Waters Garden expert will pick the perfect plants for you, personally. The Personal Garden Shopper, only at Waters Garden Center in Prescott. So we have a couple service announcements. One, free garden classes. It's kind of one that we usually will do. But every Saturday here at the Garden Center, there's a free class. If you just want to hang out with other really cool, neat people that don't mind wearing floral gloves and fancy garden hats and just like talking Latin names of plants and learning more, gardening, you never learn all there is to know about gardening. It's just it's just impossible. It, it, about the time you learn it all, they change it or something else happens. And so it's kind of fun to hang out with other gardeners and just talk gardening. So there's a garden class. It's mainly for newer folks. I notice over half the people that come are brand new to the area. They're just trying to up their game before they commit, you know, a thousand dollar bill to up to landscape in their backyard. They want to know what they're doing. And so your next week it's secret gardens with privacy hedges and screens. So Lisa mentioned that. So we're going to go in depth and show and tell, right? Just go right down the line. Here's what it does. Here's how many you'll need per foot, per square, how, how to plant it, what the math is to how many will I need, how to intermix to make it look natural or more formal. So that's next Saturday, the 19th at 9.30. Every, every, every week is at 9.30 to 10.30. And then the, the last Saturday in August is ground covers, vines, and erosion control. So if you just want to soften all that rock. If you're having some washing where the rains have kind of started to wash the rock away, uh, plants are a great way to go. I'm sure we'll cover grasses, all the vines for the area from clematis to honeysuckles to trumpet vines to akebia, some of the newest, fanciest vines around, and then all the low-growing shrubs and perennials. We'll go over that in detail. And then after that, September 2nd, the edible landscape. There we'll get into blackberries, raspberries, fruit trees, and the list goes on and on and on through fall. So take a look at watersgardencenter.com for the entire list. On the very front page, you'll just see a great big classes button. Everything's free. Uh, so we have guest speakers, chefs come in. Just We never know who's going to speak. Each week it's a different topic. But there can be 40 to 80 people here to class. So it's one that you, if you, if it sounds like a popular class, you might want to bring your own camp chair or folding chair because that way you're insured to have a place for your bum to rest because it can be crowded. It can be standing room only uh, because they're free and they're, they're informative. They're entertaining and you will be a better gardener after, after attending one. Secondly, there's the Get Real Men's Expo, which I'm one of the guys that's on the committee that kind of helps put it together. We plan all year. 
We've been planning this. This is our sixth year, and it grew from Prescott Mile High Middle School when it's first year to this is our sixth year. First year was there. Then we moved to the high school as we grew, and now we've grown past the, the theater at the high school. I think that holds 700. Now we're at Yavapai College, so the, that, that theater holds 1,200. And so we're going to take up the entire parking lot area along with the farmer's market there at Yavapai College. should be energetic and fun. Then at 11 o'clock, we have Tommy Bowden, a coach. He was a past Clemson coach, a famous, famous coach for Clemson University. Many, many national titles. How did he do it? How did he have his Christian values? How does he spread that? How does he influence? How does he, hey, he's coming to share that. He's our kind of the insider scooped for how his faith influenced his football coaching styles. He's flying in from the South to, just to talk to us for about an hour. Everything is free. It goes from eleven from 8.30 to 1. He speaks at 11. And there's helicopters. There's armored cars. There's Survivor Man stuff. There's boats. There's ATVs. There's axe throwing and golf chipping and baseball and archery. And if you're a man, you're going to feel the testosterone. If you're a woman, you're going to feel the testosterone. Come. Car shows, all kinds of stuff. But it's uh, Saturday, August 19th from 8.30 to 1. Come visit the Get Real Men's Expo at Yavapai College in Prescott. I was raised in a nice house with my family. Now I'm out on my own and have my own apartment. I love my cute little place, but there's something I do miss. I miss my mom's garden in the backyard. It was so special because over the years I was growing up, I watched her give those flowers and plants such a personal, loving touch and so much color. I miss it so. Well, guess what? I just visited my local garden center and they gave me some great ideas. And now, because of them, when I look out my patio window, I see the beautiful planter they suggested, teeming with flowers, bright Arizona flowers. Looking at those flowers gives me such a nice feeling, and it's almost like being with mom in the backyard all over again. Want help with planting? It's all online at plant-something.org. Brought to you by the Arizona Nursery Association at plant-something.org. You'll love it, too. We believe local businesses are better than impersonal box stores at Waters Garden Center. You've been listening to local garden expert Ken Lane, the owner of Waters Garden Center in Prescott. Join him each week as he answers timely garden questions unique to the area. He can be found throughout the week at Waters Garden Center located in Prescott at 1815 Iron Springs Road. Thanks for tuning in to The Mountain Gardener.